Mate, 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 so interested in getting your take on the last sort of 24 hours. I came back off holiday to this this Farage bombshell yesterday. We saw him in Clacton. I was picked up by somebody earlier, quite rightly. I was messing around about the milkshake story and, and this, this woman, Amanda, texted me and said, Jez, that could have been acid. That's what's wrong with this country. Um, were you in Clacton? Did you watch what happened? What do you make of the last 24 hours in the world, according to Nigel Farage? I think it was certainly a scary moment. That's the word that Nigel Farage has used himself. And it really sort of epitomises, I think, how much of the sharp end candidates in this election feel. Because we've heard so much over the last 10 years, since the murder of two MPs, about the dangers posed to our senior politicians, those who sit in Parliament for us. But at this election, it seems as though so many candidates themselves are being subject to threats and abuse. And actually, I know that there are lots of people who are pleased that it's a summer election because they feel safer yeah. going out and campaigning in the daylight as opposed to in the sort of late afternoon when uh, the light's barely, barely sort of there anymore. So I think Nigel Farage, he seems to have sort of shaken it off quite well. He's made a joke about it. I think he said, my milkshake brings all the people to the rally. <laughs> yeah, he did. He did a, he did a post. See, which is that, as your other caller said, if this could have been acid, if, yeah. if one woman could sort of get through the security and uh, and hurt him in this way, then it could happen. It, it could have been somebody with far more nefarious intentions. Do you believe that, that his intervention yesterday, taking over the leadership of reform, standing in Clacton, we had Richard Tice on before. We've heard from the Tory party who say this is just going to hand the keys to 10 Downing Street to Sakia Starmer. Do you believe if you get rid of all the pizzazz and all that sort of stuff, that he's a serious player and that this is the beginning, in his words, of something quite real and special? It certainly could be. I mean, this is obviously Nigel Farage's eighth tilt at the job. Yep. And he's been unsuccessful in every previous one. So sort of take it all with a big pinch of salt. But if you like, the conditions for him running couldn't be better. There has never been such a sort of high discontent with the Conservative government. And it creates this huge sort of vacuum, this space on the right of the party for Nigel Farage and reform to sort of sweep in. Now, they've been averaging at sort of 12, 15 percent in the opinion polls over the last few months. They've been struggling to make much of a breakthrough in the sort of real electoral tests. So, for example, in some of the by-elections that we've seen and indeed in the local elections uh, earlier this month. But I suppose the question really is, is this Nigel Farage's best shot at the job? And I think it probably is. I think the latest MRP poll, which is basically a sort of mega poll of all of the constituencies conducted of around 10,000 people suggested that Clacton was still one of the seats that the Tories would win. But that was prior to Nigel Farage making his announcement. I know there are senior Tories who are really worried about the threat of reform more broadly and think this is exactly the sort of seat where they could do very well and potentially claim their first MP. Um, tonight we have the TV battle part one. Uh, Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, ITV. Millions of viewers are expected to watch, really. Um, there's only going to be two of them. We were talking earlier. You're an experienced political commentator. Somebody came up with a great phrase, which was um, uh, Starmer's approach is sort of the Ming vase policy. He doesn't want to drop anything, doesn't want to give too much away. He's leading by 20 points. And yet there are many on the Tory side who believe that St Sunak needs to come out all guns blazing. Um, actually, it's really interesting. Jack Elsom said earlier... He's quite thin-skinned. He got quite tetchy, didn't he, when he was up against Liz Truss. Can you see that rearing its ugly head again? It's quite possible, yeah. I mean, I'm very used to watching Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak sort of going at each other over the dispatch box in the House of Commons. But normally their aim really is to sort of entertain and rile up the people on the benches behind them. Um, and the people watching are sort of political anoraks like me. Tonight's TV debate is going to be so interesting because actually is these it? two politicians will be introduced to people that aren't very familiar with them. Yeah. And so I think they will try and keep their pitches quite safe. Um, they don't want to get sort of drawn into political sort of mudslinging too much against each other or being drawn on um, sort of cynical but if media. You, all right, but if you were advising, if you, if you were advising Sunak tonight... I mean, if I was advising sooner, I'd say to him, you've got 30 days, mate. You are you are so far behind. You need to throw caution to the wind. Stop throwing out policies that people see through and go, you're just doing that and speak from the heart. Admit that that it hasn't been great. Talk about what the other options might be for the British people and come out fighting a bit like Farage. Sama doesn't need to do that, but he needs to be, I think, on the front foot soon, surely. I think that Sunak will have to show some form of contrition because, yeah. of course, 
The polls have not moved, basically, since he took over as Prime Minister in October 2022. And so we all know what happened to Boris Johnson and Liz Trust. I think he will have to suggest that he uh, doesn't agree with what his predecessor did and, and is continuing to say in office. Uh, my understanding from senior sort of CCHQ aides is that they're planning to be very, very aggressive about Keir Starmer's record as Director of Public Prosecutions. That's where they sort of see the, the best room to exploit what they see as his weaknesses and to try and sow doubt in the mind of the general public. I think they'll also try and paint him as a, a flip-flopper, suggesting that he had one big policy in the 28 billion green investment plan, which he then uh, junked or at least significantly watered down. And so try and present Sir Keir Starmer as really a sort of unsafe pair of hands. It's, it's, it's about sort of grabbing the initiative, isn't it, in these sorts of things. And you look back, we were talking about this yesterday, Aubrey, with, with a couple of people. You look back at those politicians who have swept all before them and they've taken the British people with them. Thatcher, yes, Blair, undoubtedly in 1997. I remember that distinctly. It was like a you could feel this wave. Now, I don't believe personally that there's a wave for Starmer or even the Labour Party. I think there's massive, massive frustration, anger and disappointment with 14 years of Tory rule. And I bring him into the equation only because I'm talking about your approach and the aesthetics of it. Farage has created in 24 hours a very vibe that we ain't got. Maybe Sunak and Starmer just aren't like that. And maybe they got elected because of all the the madness of before, but I still believe, I know we're a, an, a, a country that goes with parties, but I still believe that voters buy into passion, desire, honesty, all those sorts of things that actually many people today are saying to me they don't see in politics. I mean, Ed Davey, I mean, is, we, we saw that link from Ed Davey. How are you going to pay for it? All oh, this too, we can't get a doctor's appointment. No, you can't get a doctor. No, the NHS doesn't. No, what are you going to do? They don't say anything. They don't give us anything to get our teeth into. And one final thing I would say is I think the British people are, are past being taken for idiots. I think they're more switched on than ever politically, don't you? Well, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, if you look at the, the sort of uh, impact that TV debates will have, they are a chance for politicians to showcase a bit more about their personality, to try and come across as quite genuine and almost conviction-led politicians, which in the House of Commons, when they're sometimes arguing about policy, doesn't quite come across. I mean, think back to 2010 when um, Nick Clegg managed to galvanise Clegg mania and he sort of managed to get everybody on his side with a really sort of strong performance. It wasn't ultimately enough to really help his party uh, too dramatically to the seats that they would have got if they'd actually got what was uh, what they polled. But I think both these politicians are sort of technocrats. They want to show the country that they are a safe pair of hands and that ultimately you're better off without the sort of chaos of the Boris Johnson and Liz Truss years. The question is kind of who can play it safest. Just very quickly, a couple of things. Migration cap today. The Tories are migration cap without a number. Uh, the Labour Party have responded by saying immigration is a disaster without a number or a plan. Even Farage wants no immigration, but has absolutely, well, he doesn't seem to have too much of a plan. It's just the problem that won't go away, Aubrey Allegretti, isn't it? From anybody. It certainly is. I mean, I, I think I asked Keir Starmer about this a few weeks ago at his uh, campaign launch, where I basically said, you said you want to reduce the number of uh, legal migrants coming into this country and increase sort of development of skills of domestic workers. How are you going to do it? How much do you want to decrease legal migration by? And answer there came none. So I suspect that the Labour Party doesn't have a sort of fixed position on how much it wants to reduce migration by, but it can still say that the Conservatives have abjectly failed in their ambition to reduce immigration or net migration rather to the tens of thousands. I think that's a promise that is sort of ringing in the ears of the Conservative Party ever since it was made by David Cameron. And the other thing is about cynicism, very quickly, just to finish tonight, George Osborne, the ex-Chancellor, of course, with Cameron, has uh, described the proposal to get rid of death duties, inheritance tax, as one last political potent throw of the dice. I mean, again, I, I have to be completely imbalanced, imbalanced, and I am, and I'm imbalanced, and I am imbalanced. I have to say this: this is another thing that you would associate with the Tory Party, but with a month to go, people are going to go. You're just trying to buy him a vote. I think that's right, and, and it's one of the reasons that the Conservatives sort of didn't end up going for a November election because that would have probably meant pressure on them to. Uh, make another uh, fiscal statement, i.e. announce some tax cuts. And I think voters, they were not giving the government credit for it. It, it happened in November last year. The government got zero credit for it. Uh, again, national increase cut by two pence in March this year. The government got no credit for it. So voters are, are, are not 
they're ignorant. They're not stupid. They can they can see the yeah, sort of political that. machinations at play here. Um, so question to you, uh, two questions before you go. Um, it's National Smile Week. What makes Aubrey Allegretti from The Times smile? Uh, elections. They are they are my Christmas, uh, except they come <laughs> around once every five years. You absolute nerd. I love it. And will you, this is the five, this is another, this is another, uh, will you be watching the TV debate tonight or listening to Kev O'Sullivan? Uh, both. I